All right. So good morning. My name is Tom Tanner. I'm with the Small Business Center. Also, we have Cheryl Tucker with us. She's also in our office. She will be looking over the chat stuff today. So we're going to be talking about mandatory sick leave tax credits and a little bit about retention credits. So before we get started, I have to get my advancer working, which is not. There we go. All right, so the webinar is based on information available at the time of the presentation. Just like everything else has anything to do with PPP, EIDL, or anything else to do with this COVID, it seems like it's a moving target. Uh, I think that it's pretty standard and it's not gonna change much, but just letting you know that before you apply for your credits, you might wanna check with your accountant or read on the IRS website just to make sure there hasn't been any changes made. Um, if you're not familiar with the Emergency Effects Disease Prevention Standards, which is something that went into effect uh, at the beginning of August, or actually the end of July, it's a requirement for every business to have training and a plan in effect um, to cover the signage, training, all kind of stuff. This applies to every business that has employees. We, on a state level, have created a website uh, listed below, and that website has almost everything you need to know about this particular requirement, it has sample signs, um, training programs, and things like that. So just to make you aware, we're not gonna be talking about that today, but it kind of runs into what we're gonna be talking about. So things to know, please be sure your microphone is on mute, especially if you've called in, because sometimes the phone will not mute it automatically. If you have questions, add it to the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And after we finish the first section, I'll cover any questions around the first section, then I'll start on the second section. The presentation will be recorded and a link sent out afterwards along with a copy of the presentation. So you'll have everything that I'll be talking about today. So what we're gonna talk about today is the Family First Coronavirus Response Act and primarily the things we're gonna be talking about is the paid leave rights, which include the qualified sick leave, qualified family leave, and also talk a little bit about the employee retention credits. Most of this is going to be talking about the paid leave rights, which is a more complicated program than employee retention credits. So if you have an employee or more than an employee, you need to make sure this poster, which is available through the Department of Labor's website, and I can also attach it when I send out anything at the um, conclusion of this webinar that every this needs to be posted in your facility if you have employees that come and go or work at home and come in from time to time you may even want to make a copy of this and send it to them so they know that they receive information so what is the family first coronavirus response act well the first off it requires most employees and that means most if not all employees to provide sick leave to their employees under certain circumstances. It also provides tax credits to cover these costs providing to employees with paid sick leave. If they took this leave between April 1st and December 31st, and it was related to COVID-19, following the things that we're gonna be talking about. The act also covers expanded family medical leave wages, which will also be covered. So what is included in qualified sick leave wages? In other words, how do I know an individual qualifies for sick leave wages? So first off, is the person subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19? Or have they been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to these, uh, due to COVID-19? Are they experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and saying, hey, I need, to go, I need to go seek some medical diagnosis to see if I've actually got this thing? Or are they caring for an individual who is subject to quarantine or isolation order or has been advised to self-quarantine? And last, are they caring for a child or employee if the school or place of care is closed or unavailable due to COVID-19? 
So we're going to start with the qualified sick leave wages. So the qualified sick leave wages are the wages actually um, paid to the employee who is unable to work or telework. And this is the, the important word to keep an eye on. Um, and then they bring it up in, throughout the uh, rules and regulation is that if an individual, just because they can't come to work, if they can telework, then they're not going to be covered under this. If they can't work or telework, then they could be covered. So it means if they're quarantined or self-quarantined or have symptoms and seeking medical diagnosis, that's what we just talked about, or the employee needs to care for others with COVID-19, or the child or school or place of, is closed or unavailable due to COVID-19. So what is the credit? So it's broken down into two, situ two things. First of all, the employee's sick. The employee has has been told to quarantine, he has been tested positive, um, he's seeking advice because he feels sick, et cetera, et cetera. Under this scenario, you are allowed to pay 10 days worth of sick pay to them. If they're full-time, that means 80 hours. If they're part-time, then basically that means whatever their average weight, or their average number of hours they worked during a two-week period and they don't give a stipulation of what the time period is, but basically on average, if they're working 20 hours a week, then you would pay them for 40 hours, okay? It'd be for qualified sick leave phase during a quarter. In a, and they use the word quarter because that's the reporting period, but it's <clears throat> you still are allowed to pay throughout the entire period of April 1st through December 31st. Employee, so this covers employees' regular wages and their health care expenses. So whatever they're regularly paid for these 80 hours, that's what they get paid for sick time. Plus, you can cover their health care expenses. The maximum amount is a $511 a day, which means 10 days times 511 gives you $500 max. So that's the maximum you can pay. So that's the employee becoming sick. So part two of this is caring for others and caring for others means somebody else is sick in the family or you have that child care situation where the child cannot, somebody has to watch the child because the daycare center's closed, the school's closed, or whatever it is. So this is covers up to 10 days, again, 80 hours for full time or based on whatever part time is, except you're only paying two thirds of the employee's regular pay Plus you can add in their healthcare expenses. So again, this is only two thirds. The big difference is the maximum amount is $200 a day, which again, mathematically speaking, 10 days of 200 is $2,000 maximum that can be paid. Now, the question may come up is, well, can I pay them more than, can I pay them their full price? Can I pay them their regular wages? Sure you can, but you're not gonna be reimbursed for it. You're only gonna be reimbursed for two thirds of it and only can be re, re, uh, reimbursed for up to $200. Of course, it's the lesser of the two. All right, so now after these programs of these 10 days, you now move into what we call qualified family leave wages. So these are wages paid to employees who's unable to work or telework because the employee is caring for a child whose school or place of care is unavailable due to COVID-19 related reasons, okay? You notice this is the same terminology that was used in the sick leave wages. Well, it is the same, except it doesn't include the employee being sick and it doesn't include caring for others in the house that are sick. Only applies to um, caring for a child whose school or place of care is unavailable. In order to qualify this, you must be employed, the employee must be employed for at least 30 days or for some reason they're laid off at least 30 of the last 60 days. Under the sick leave, everybody is included. There's no waiting period. This is the only one where there's a 30 day waiting period. So how much is this credit? Well, the first 10 days aren't covered because they're covered under the sick leave. So what happens, it picks up after the first 10 days or after the first two weeks. So what happens, it covers for up to another 10 weeks uh, of coverage. So under this case scenario, it's the same thing. It's limited to two thirds of the employee's wages, plus adding in their healthcare expenses. 
and it's also limited to $200 a day. So the maximum amount is a $10,000, which mathematically is 200 times 50, which is five, 10 weeks times five days a week. Again, if you pay more than that, you're not gonna be reimbursed for that. So what about taxes on this particular program? So employee is subject to income tax, they're subject to social security tax, and they're subject to Medicare tax, okay? What about the employer? Well, the employer is subject to Medicare tax. I don't understand why, but they're subject to Medicare tax, but you are reimbursed for it as part of the credit. So, and there's not subject to any social security tax. For all intents and purposes, the employer, if it follows the rule of how much is paid, then the credit will take care of 100% of the wages that you that you have to have for out of your pocket expenses. So how to determine employee hours? We just talked about that part-time employees is based on the number of hours on average. So what are qualified health plan expenses? Pretty much if you're paying for a group health plan under your uh, company for whatever, that's covered. It does not include, if you happen to pay into an HSA, that's not part of it. If you do pay, make, include payments to an HR day, which is a health reimbursement account, those do include. So how do I claim this credit? So if you're a small business other than self-employed, which we'll talk about in a minute, the credit is taken on your IRS form 941 each quarter, and the 941 is your quarterly federal tax return for payroll. Okay, so what happens is, is that you, you, during your, if you're familiar with a 941, you make payments based on the size of your business, make it every two weeks or once a month or once a quarter based on the size business you are. So if you know you, you're paying a certain amount in wages that you're going to get reimbursed for, what you can do is hold off on making deposits for that amount whether it's Social Security withholding, Medicare, or whatever, you can withhold it from all your employees to match that credit. So again, the idea is, is that you're not having to dig into your pocket to get money to pay individuals and then try to get reimbursed later on. If for some reason your credit is so large that even your withholding and your other taxes are not enough, you can actually file a Form 7200 and you can receive a refund prior to your quarterly filing. So you can also get additional money if you go, I, even after all this, I still don't have enough money to pay all my employees. Um, then you can file this form 7200. But in most circumstances, I think that um, withholding your deposits is probably gonna be more than adequate enough. So I'm not gonna cover the, the actual form. I just wanted to show you if you're not familiar with a 941, but it does have It'll show you qualified sick leave wages, qualified family leave wages, and you'll also notice if you're, again, if you're familiar with this form, you'll notice it says taxable social security wages at 12.4%, qualified sick leave and qualified family leave is only at 6.2. That's because, again, the employer portion is not taxable. All right? And then there's also a non reformable portion down here. So now we go to the next form, which is still the 941. And you'll see up here, it'll say, what are the qualified health plan expenses allocated qualified sick leave, qualified family leave, healthcare expenses. There's also a line that they're talking about employee retention credits, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end of the program about the retention credit, but there's also a line here for the retention credit. And then the very end here, we'll talk about all the credits. If you follow a form 7200, you'll see it says total advantage, uh, advantage received from filing form 7200. That's if you're asking for it in advance. There's also this thing talking about worksheets and things like that. Most of you are probably gonna have computerized systems that are gonna generate these reports for you and most likely are, are not gonna affect you. Um, but this is the worksheet. If anybody's ever worked with IRS forms, they know they always like worksheets. 
So I just put it in here so you can see, but most likely you would never have a need to even use this worksheet. All right, so this is the 7200. So this is the advanced payment for emergency. So if for some reason you say, I still don't have enough money, I wanna get the IRS to send me some money up front, you can do this by filing this particular form. Again, most of you will probably not need to, but it is available. All right, so are self-employed entitled to this particular program? So first of all, it must be carrying on a trade or business and be qualified to receive if you're working for somebody else. So in other words, if you were an employee from somebody else, would you qualify? I mean, in most cases you would. So the way it works for the self-employed, it's, it's an offset to your self-employment tax because you don't file 941s and things like that. You're basically just file um, your tax return on an annual basis. So you must not be able to work or telework. Again, that word telework comes up because you're subject to a state, federal, local quarantine or isolation order, been advised by healthcare provider to self-quarantine, is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking medical diagnosis. You're caring for others that have been quarantined or been advised to is caring for a child whose place um, place of care is closed. So this is exactly the same thing that applies under the um, sick leave and the Family Leave Act. So it just, it it's applies for self-employed also. So if you're a worker, which means you're the owner, <clears throat> the pay is based on the number of days you as an individual, you as a self-employed person, cannot perform services. So this is a number that you're gonna have to figure out how do I document or how do I consider what's the number of days I cannot work. So if you're quarantined, it's pretty easy. You can't go to work unless you can telework. If you're staying at home because of your children, that's you know a different situation, you can also document that. So again, this is equal to 100% of the average daily self-employment net income for the taxable year. So what is average daily self-employment income? Well, it's again, it's the net earnings from self-employment tax. So this is what, if you have all your revenue minus all your expenses, it would flow over to your Schedule SE or your self-employment schedule, or on your Schedule C it would be your net income divided by 260. 260 being five weeks, five days, five days times 52 weeks is 260. So that gives you the daily, daily time the number of days, and that gives you the number that you can get a credit for. And this is the maximum amount of $511 a day. With, so you have a maximum of $5,110 that you can get. Again, this is for you as the worker if you are sick and cannot work. Now, if you're caring for others or the place of business is closed, et cetera, et cetera, the pay is basically the exactly the same way. You figure out your net self-employment income, except it's equal to 67% of the daily self-employment income with a maximum of $200 a day, all right? So now it rolls into the family leave. After the 10-day period, it rolls into the family leave just like it does for everybody else. You're caring, but it only covers, again, only covers covers for the child whose place of care is closed. Um, it's only pay is based on the number of days an individual cannot perform services. So if you're in a business where you're in a construction business, and you cannot, it's not something you can telework do, you cannot physically go out and do the work, then you can easily document how many days you are not able to work because you're having to stay home to take care of your child. This is equal to 67% of the average daily self and in income for the taxable year, same formula we used from before. It's good up to 50 days, which is 10 weeks. So the maximum of $200 a day, again, it's gonna be the lesser of the two. So your maximum amount is $10,000 for that period. So again, the credit for the self-employed is taken on your 2020 1040 tax return. So if you know you are going to be taking this credit, rather than since you're not filing 941s, you can't withhold money, what you do is just lower your estimated tax payments that you make on your quarterly tax payments. 
so that when you file your 2020 tax return and you figure this credit into the equation, it's already kind of subtracted out the amount of money that you would be already sent in with your quarterly estimates. All right, so there is a small business exemption and this small business exemption applies to 50 employees, I mean employees that have less than 50 employees. Um, they can file a claim for an exemption under following circumstances. I wrote these, there's a lot on this slide, but what I did is I copied the exact language from the act so that there's no misunderstanding what this act says. So I'm just gonna cover it and then kind of offer a little bit of an explanation. So such leave would cause the small employee's expenses and financial obligations to exceed available business revenue and cause the small employee to cease operating at a minimum capacity. Basically what they're saying is that if I got this, you know, started paying this leave, um, I'd let people would not be here to basically keep my business operating and I would basically go out of business which kind of flows also into the second part, which is the absent of the employee. Our employees requesting such leave would pose a substantial risk to the financial health or operational capacity of the small employee because of their specialized skills, knowledge of the business or responsibilities. The small employee cannot find enough workers who are able to and willing and qualified who be able to at the time and place needed to perform the labor and service to the employee or employees requesting leave provide. Again, so the only way that you can get an exemption is if the business cannot financially sustain itself without these individuals or that you can't find other people that would be able to fill these particular roles. Okay, if you apply for these, I mean, if you, uh, uh, applies to your business, you don't physically apply for it, but you, you must document the facts and circumstances that meet the criteria listed in the previous slide. This is the critical part is that if you get audited, you're going to have to prove that this was a, you know, lending these people off would have caused you dire circumstances and probably caused your business to go out of business. You're not required to send any documents to the Department of Labor to ask for approval to do this. And a lot of the documents that you'll read, it'll say that you can request a waiver from the Department of Labor. There is not a waiver request. It's basically you're on your own to basically say, I need to take this waiver. Um, but again, you need to make sure you document everything. So in the event that they say, come back at you for an audit or request for documents, you've properly documented that you could not have stayed in business. You still have to post a notice that we, I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. That is still required even if you're filing an exemption. And you may file, be a, just because you have an exemption for your business may not mean that you can't let some of your employees who may not be critical to the operation still get the credit. You just may not be able to allow certain employees to do it. So what do I need to document that I'm actually doing this? So if you have an employee that falls under this particular scenario, then you would need to have documentation of the employee's name, the dates or dates for which the leave is requested, a statement for the COVID-19 related reason the employee is requesting leave and written support for such reason. In other words, why are they requesting it? Do they, are they tested positive, they've been quarantined, they've been asked to quarantine, et cetera, et cetera. So a statement the employee is unable to work, including telework. So you need to have a statement that says, this person cannot perform the duties at work or telework and therefore qualify for the, um, qualify for the credit. In the case of a leave request based on a quarantine order or self-quarantine order, you need to have a statement from the employee, including the name of the entity ordering the quarantine, or if it's from a healthcare pro professional, you need to have something from the healthcare professional saying they advise that this individual quarantines. In the case of a school or childcare provider closing due to COVID-19 reason, and this applies to you know the, the Family Act and the um, Sick Leave Act, the statement must include the name and age of the child, 
the name of the school or provider closed and a statement from employee that no other person will be providing care during that pay period. In other words, and once you've taken it and then you find out that, uh, oh, somebody else has already taken care of, I just wanted to not work. So from the business side of the equation, what, what do you have to maintain? First of all, um, it's for four years. You have to maintain these records for four years. All the documentation listed in the previous slide for employee. You also have to document how you figured your amount of sick leave wages. How was that determined? If you did employee pl health plan expenses, how did you determine those particular numbers? If you filed a form 7200, you need to complete all the copies of the 7200. Um, have those available. If you file form 941, you have to make sure you keep all your form 941s for the covered period. So some other questions uh, I just came up with, and I'm sure you're gonna have some more here in a second, is dates of coverage is from April 1st to December 31st. Can an employee receive tax credits for qualified leave wages and the employee retention credit, which we'll talk about in a second? Yes, but you can't do them for the same wages, so it'd have to be drawn for two different wages. Can you receive the credit for qualified leave wages and a PPP loan? Yes, but again, not for the same wages. And the same thing for a disaster loan or an EIDL loan. You can, but not for the same wages. Can I reduce the amount of 941 payments to pay for the payment for requirements under these programs? Just as we mentioned before, if you want to take some of the, your quarterly deposits, your monthly deposits, your biweekly deposits, and withhold the amount for the credit, you're welcome to do that. You just can't do it for more than the amount of the credit. Is qualified sick and family leave wages taxable to employees? Yes, we talked about that. Income tax, social security tax, and Medicare tax are all subject to taxes by the employee. Is the tax credit taxable to the business that receives the credit? Yes, the credit must be added in as income, but the expenses that are associated with the credit are deductible. So if anybody had a PPP loan, you learned that it was exactly the opposite of this. So in this case here, you do have to add as income, but you can also subtract out the expenses. If your company uses a third party payroll service or a professional employer organization, you can still claim the credit, especially if a PEO, it works a little different. You just check with them, they can take care of you. And a tax exempt organization can receive the credit. Uh, again, as long as you're filing a form 941. All right, so that's the first section. I wanted to see what kind of chat questions. Um, Cheryl, do we have any questions or do I move on? No, we certainly do. Um, the first one is, what is the definition of caring for others? Uh, it says, including anyone in their household, whether official family or not, significant other. And um, based on what I've been looking at, Tom, and you can add to this, the definition is for a son or daughter is your own child, which includes your biological adopted or foster child, your stepchild, a legal ward, or a child for whom you are standing in loco parents, someone with the day-to-day -day responsibilities to care for or financially support a child. Yeah. Um, so basically so, we look at that as, as, the, as a dependent, a taxable dependent or somebody who's a member of the family. Because sometimes a dependent is not necessarily a family member, but it could be a, uh, so it could be a dependent or a family member. It can't just be, you know, your next door neighbor or whatever. But that's a good definition. And it would be based on what you're filing on your taxes, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or okay. even though it could also be another family member, such as your, your mom or something else that wouldn't be on your tax return. But uh, I was just saying a dependent because a dependent could be on your tax return, but not a family member. Correct. Okay. okay. Um, and then there's another one. Uh, if we did not claim the credits on our 941 for the second quarter, should we file an amended return? Or can we just claim the credits on the quarter uh, three, 941, even though some of the sick pay was incurred in quarter two? So if you incurred the, the payment in quarter two, um, that's an interesting question because it's going to mess up your 941s as to the credit. I, I think you're probably best to file an amended 
uh, amended 941 in the quarter that you actually did the uh, payment of your sick leave. Yes, and um, the next question is, are all businesses, even those under the 10 employees, subject to these requirements? Yes, if you have an employee, you're subject to this requirement. So yes, but again, you gotta remember that these requirements, you're basically paying people to um, take off, but they're reimbursing you 100%. So you're, you're, it's not really costing the business anything other than the ability of not having those individuals at work, which if you still fall on, you still can look at the exemption, if it's gonna be detrimental to your business, you could claim an exemption. Um, question, uh, do you have to pay employees who vacation in a hot spot and you tell them if they go, they have to quarantine in advance of vacation? Um, good question. I don't know. I, I guess that would kind of fall under the self quarantine situation. Um, good question. We'll have to keep that and do a little research on that, but I'm thinking that's part of self quarantine. Mm -hmm. And, um, what if an employee wants to work half time and cannot work full time due to caring for others or caring for a child? Um, I, is it all or nothing? Do they have to work full time? You know, or, I think we can probably split it as long as it doesn't add up to more than the 80 hours. I, or, or if it's done to the family leave, it doesn't add up more than the 10 weeks. I, I don't see a reason why you couldn't split it up because it doesn't say anywhere in the regulation it has to be consecutive 10 days or consecutive 10 weeks. I think that's all for the first half of the uh, presentation. All right, so now we're gonna jump into the retention credits, which is probably not gonna to apply to a lot of you, but I just wanted to at least mention it so that you're, you know that these are available. So the employee retention credits, and these have been available since day one, but it only can be taken if your business is fully or partially suspended operations during any quarter in 2020 due to the orders from the government authority, limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings due to COVID-19. So basically, if you had to shut your business down because the government told you to, then you can qualify for the retention credits under this particular situation. The other way you can qualify for it is if your business stayed open and wasn't required to close because of the suspended operation, but you lost more than 50% of your gross receipts in a calendar quarter compared to 2019, you would also um, come under this particular uh, ability to, to file for retention credits. Again, you've got, you can file under either one of these, either you've been suspended, you closed your business, or you your, your um, gross receipts declined more than 50%, then you can also claim this particular retention credits. So you're not available. Probably the one thing that throws, it's going to throw more people out than anything else is if your business has received a PPP loan, you do not qualify for this credit. If you're self-employed, you do not file, qualify for this credit. So I know that's going to kick out a lot of people. Um, but again, I want to just mention it for individuals who have not received a PPP loan and not self-employed that you could qualify for it. The other thing is if you voluntarily shut down or reduced hours, you do not qualify for it. Even though if you shut down voluntarily, you're, you're probably gonna fall into the 50% rule because you're, if you're shut down, you're probably not gonna have any re revenue. So you would, fall, you would fall under that criteria, but you couldn't fall under it just because you voluntarily shut down or reduced hours. So the way it works is any wages paid between March 12th in January, I'm sorry, it's actually, yeah, between March 12th and January 1st, which basically means um, D March 13th and December 31st, on um, 2020, you get 50% credit of qualified wages on the first $10,000 per employee. So it means that if employee, if you fall under these particular 
um, situations and you have an employee that earns $10,000 during the period that you are under this particular circumstance, then you can get asked for a maximum credit of $5,000. And you can continue to file as long as the business is still closed or partially closed due to government restrictions. In other words, if the, if the business is closed, or partially closed because of government restrictions, then you can continue to file for this. If your business dropped below 50% and in any, compared to any quarter and you still have not gone back to at least 80%, you can continue to, to claim that credit or continue to build up that $10,000 amount for each employee during that time period. Again, you had to have dropped below 50% for a quarter. After that quarter, you can continue to claim it until you've reached 80%. So it includes qualified health plan expenses, so you can throw those in there. It's not limited to any side businesses. Tax exempt organizations are eligible. A little bit of a kicker here is wages paid to employees who are related to an owner of 50% or more cannot take the credit. Um, employee and employer Medicare and Social Security are owed. So both the employee and employee have to pay Social Security. The other um, nice little thing is small businesses less than 100 employees can take the credit whether employees are working or not. So if you're actually paying, if you have less than 100 employees, which pretty much everybody does here, is that you can have your employees working and pay your employees working and you can still take that credit. If you have more than 100 employees, they have to be actually laid off in order to get the credit. But for small businesses, you can actually be paying them and they can in turn, you can still file for a credit and get the credit for it, which is kind of cool. So again, the credit is taken just like the employee sick leave, it's taken on a 941. You can also file for uh, form 7200 to also get the appropriate information, you know, get a, a refund ahead of time. Taxability of credit, well, this goes back to the other one, which is not included in income for businesses, but businesses can't take deductions for expenses. So basically under all these programs, it's a net net so that it doesn't cost you anything, but you don't get any deductions for it. So that is pretty much the, um, the employee retention credit. And I will, open it up for questions as soon as I figure out how to stop recording. <laughs>